We good? All right. Cool. So let's get started. Uh, you guys all kind of know the topic, so you're probably familiar with JSX and React and the whole concept. But just in case, uh, let's do kind of a quick show of hands. How many of you, the first time you saw JSX, uh, like an example, went straight to Twitter and like shouted about it, said something like, get that XML out of my JavaScript? I know more of you did. I mean, it's just, yeah, you're probably embarrassed because it's awesome now and you don't want to admit that, but that's okay. Um, so I'm going to assume that you all raised your hands. That would make you the perfect audience for this talk. So let's go forward with that. Uh, the reason this is an issue is because several years ago, the concept of uh, separation of concerns was introduced. Uh, I don't know that he came up with it, but Jeffrey Zeldman uh, pioneered a lot of the idea. He, was, uh, he published a book that probably a lot of us have read. Uh, the basic thrust was we need to separate the concept of execution, presentation, and uh, markup of, of, what your, uh, component, of what your website is made of from each other so we can reason about, about them better, but I think also so that we could uh, make more dry websites, right? So 1999, we're all making our GeoCities site, and we probably set up uh, 10 pages, right? That's a big site back then, right? Uh, and you've got some scripts that you have to run on each one. Every time somebody clicks X, something is supposed to happen. Uh, you've got styles that are custom for that X, like it makes it look like a button. So what you might have done is stuck a style attribute on there and defined what it looks like, and then maybe put an on-click listener on there, out of your JavaScript. We all know this is terrible practice now, but what the reason we know it's bad practice is because we all had to go around copying those elements, copying those changes every time we made a change to each of those 10 files and hunting them down. You introduce another file later, just keep compounding that amount of work. Uh, it's just a lot of mental overhead that's totally unnecessary, especially when you can write things once. So in response, we made you know, a style folder uh, uh, markup folder, like we probably call them templates, or maybe you just still use HTML. Uh, JavaScript, or, or scripts folder, right? And they're all in their separate places. They keep all these concerns separate because that's what we're supposed to do to make things easier, right? That's, that's the dogma. Uh, so now that we're writing componentized uh, applications, we're writing an element and reusing it in several places, that concept has become dry in and of itself. We're not trying to maintain a series of documents anymore. We're trying to maintain a series of parts. Uh, so if we can do that, do we still need this separation of concern? Do we still need to have this architectural uh, decision being made that says, this is, this is behavior. It belongs in scripts. This is style. This is the way things look. It belongs in style. Uh, I would say no. I think it's actually uh, counterproductive. It's better to be able to reference all of these concepts in a, uh, the same location, if for no other reason than you don't have to dig around to find them when it's time to make edits to each of those things. Um, so yeah, that's, that's my proposal. Uh, I'll go into a little bit more detail about why I think it's important. Uh, anybody who saw this talk at uh, Denver Script a few weeks ago, it was a lightning talk version, you might be really bored uh, for about 20 minutes because I'm pretty much going to do the same thing. But then I'm going to expand on it, like I kind of promised at the end of that, and explain uh, some of the problems that you can run into and some of the workarounds. So the problem is it's difficult when you get a, a ticket, you have to go modify something. It's difficult to do it in a way predictably with the speed it should be. Somebody says, hey, I want you to change the color of this type of link. It's not necessarily as easy as, hey, I'll just go change this color. You might have overrides somewhere that are causing a problem. The the, if you had to change the markup, you might be using that markup in multiple places and not realize it. Uh, so. That's a problem that uh, I think all web app developers, all UI web app developers run into. But today I'm speaking specifically about React. Uh, React is not any worse or better than the rest as far as this goes, as far as that problem goes. Uh, but it's the tool that I'm using right now and it's the tool that I think solves these problems the best. So that's what we'll be talking about this in. Again, it's not, that's not the problem. Uh, so the problems specifically are, uh, and I'll go in more depth with these, uh, globals, uh, sharing values across concerns, the cascade, dependencies, that's a problem hopefully you're lucky enough to have, but most of us don't. Uh, findability, which you might not even think is a problem once you see it, but I think it is, and I'll, hopefully you're with me. Uh, and readability, so this is a concern I think for anybody who has to share code. You always want to be leaving things behind that other people can quickly parse, quickly understand, and quickly dive into and start working on. So. Okay, uh, 
The first problem is globals. Uh, you don't think of globals when you think of CSS, but there are a lot of globals involved. So for example, when you write JavaScript, maybe five, 10 years ago, you had a lot of different global variables out there operating on your page, and you would just throw them into one script file. And we eventually learned that that was a really messy thing to do. Uh, it caused a lot of problems. So we introduced like the revealing module pattern. Now we're doing a lot of common JS stuff, which is awesome. It's made our lives a lot easier. Uh, CSS, on the other hand, is one file, or maybe you've got it modularized, but it's a series of like classes and tag names and IDs being combined to make a global that can be picked up by the browser every time it encounters an, an element that hits all those selectors. So you could have three or four or 10 globals get applied to the same element, and then the browser has to sort all that out. But the real problem is they're all overriding each other, and depending on the order they get put in, they're overriding each other in unpredictable ways. Uh, again, this is a problem we've all dealt with. We know how to deal with it. You probably think I'm an idiot for even bringing it up. But if there's a better way to deal with it, we should, is, my, is where I'm going with this. Uh, so a good example of this, we, a lot of us probably use Bootstrap. Uh, this is an example that Chris Chidu from Facebook uh, brings up. There's 600 globals in the sense that I just described. That If you had that in JavaScript, you would probably fire the person who did it. That's, you can't work with that. But we've managed to wrangle our way through it for CSS. Uh, another problem, sharing values. Uh, this maybe is an anti-pattern, depending on your implementation. But I think it comes up for a lot of us. Uh, you're setting something up in JavaScript. You need to know that it's going to have a padding of five. But you also need to have it styled that way so it gets picked up right away when the page loads, right? Uh, down the line, somebody says, actually, that's too tight. Let's make it 10. Well, now you need to make that jump. Uh, back to the CSS file and update that to 10 as well. These need to be matching values. So most people leave a comment behind to say, hey, when you change this value, go and change it in the CSS file too. But that doesn't really account for file names changing, which happens you know, more than it should, but it does happen. Uh, or if somebody makes an edit and doesn't update the comment, if they, make the, uh, they move where that JavaScript is implemented, the comment doesn't get moved in the CSS file, it's no good anymore anyway. So it was just an ad hoc way of dealing with uh, a common problem. Uh, the cascade. This is one of the big selling points of CSS. And it, it did do a lot of good as far as being able to share things. Uh, but it's a big extent. Uh, my, that's my opinion. It's not each style extending on top of each other in a list. But the browser on each element finds matching rules, or matching uh, declarations, and then does its own extends. It does some math to do like the, the selector precedence and decide which things should get overridden, which parts of rules should get overridden. Combines all that, does the dirty work for you, but it's, again, not obviously predictable. Uh, we use extend a lot in JavaScript. It's awesome. Uh, it's great in moderation. If you had an extend that had 20 things on it, you'd probably say you're doing something wrong. Uh, we've got hundreds in CSS, potentially, depending on the rule. So a lot of us have introduced something like BEM to deal with this. Crazy naming conventions is what I call this. It's, I don't use it. I'm sorry. I know some people are like religious about it. It's, I think, a really kludgy solution to uh, the problem. You're basically saying you have to know this semantic naming style to make this system work. You need to know that style to dive in and make edits down the road. And you need to know that the people who are doing it with you are doing it correctly, or else it's all for naught. Uh, again, not my favorite thing. Sorry to other people who like it. Uh, dependencies, this is the one that you'd be lucky to have this problem. Places like Facebook have this problem, where they have an app so big that if they gave you all the CSS it takes to make that app run, it'd be a huge file, right? Or maybe multiple files. It would slow down your page load, at least the first time. So you cache it and then it'd be done. But rather than doing that, they're making specific CSS packages that go to different pages, right? So if you come in from entry point B that's way far away from home page, you're still, you're going to get the style specific for that page. And depending on how you've written your CSS, you might have written uh, styles on the home page that are going to get overwritten in those styles that you handed to page B, right? Uh, what happens if they go to, oops, sorry, go ahead. So th this is essentially an async problem, but it could be spanning a long period of time. So they could go to page B one week, two weeks later go to the home page, right? And that's, that's a problem because it's not just like one, uh, when uh, a get request is coming back before the other, it's that they're coming back way out of order in a, a timeframe that you don't even think about when you're debugging it. Uh, 
who knows what's what's going to get overridden in that uh, scenario? It's it's impossible to know really uh, until you've tested each and different each different path. Like oh, I went to C this time and went to home. I went to C and B at home. Uh, I don't know how to test for that. I don't know how to uh, QA for that. I don't know how to make it predictable. Uh, this one again, you're going to think I'm an idiot, but and maybe you guys have got better solutions to this. Finding your way through a web app can be a major pain in the butt. Uh, like, I, like I said, we're all good at it, we're quick. I can do most of this pretty fast, but uh, my solution, again, if you look at it, it's just, it's not, it doesn't feel right when you look at it laid out. Uh, so there's a lot of different ways of solving this problem, but here's ours. Uh, we've got kind of a strange legacy app that's been layered over a few years, so there's a few different ways you have to approach it. But you get a ticket, you need to fix the size, the letting, or yeah, the line height around a certain block of text on a page. So first thing you do, well, let's go find it. I'm going to grep, uh, I'm going to go to the, the web page, find the text, take that text, grep against all my template files to find out where it's being used. Hopefully it's not dynamic. And then go into the view folder and find the uh, template, or grep for the template call that's, being, that's using that HTML file or handlebars, what have you. Then you grep your style folder to find all uses of relevant classes from that uh, HTML file. Hopefully that's, there's not too much dynamism there. Uh, and then you look at the declaration and determine like the specificity. Does this get overwritten by this other rule that I came across? Uh, does it take precedence over this other one, this big uh, set of globals? Which one of the globals will win? So that's pretty simple. Uh, we've all got it down to probably doing it in like less than a minute. Don't even think twice about it. But the first time somebody showed you at your job, you probably said, oh, every, so every time I want to work on something, I have to dig through in this weird kludgy way? All right. And then you learn it and you continue the legacy. Uh, readability, I think, is a concern, especially if you're able to have a designer working on your markup, uh, which is awesome, good for you. Or if you have uh, like junior devs, maybe don't recognize things as quickly. So again, we looked at JSX the first time. We yelled at Twitter said this is hopeless, it's never going anywhere, and then it kept getting bigger and bigger. So here's why they did that, right? Here's why that decision was made to make that XML syntax, that ugly XML syntax in React. This is what it would look like, that same thing, if we just use the native create element. Like you've all had to create an element in jQuery or native or maybe in React. It's this series of arguments that the order matters, of course, uh, and then you nest them as like the third argument, or you can combine them and nest them in the third argument. That's that's straight JavaScript. Most of us can read it. Designer, a junior dev, maybe takes it's a little dense. It's hard for them to parse that. I would say. So, all right, those are the problems. We've gotten pretty good at dealing with all of them. That's why we all have jobs. We're good at dealing with these weird things that happen with CSS and browsers. Uh, but I think we can do better, uh, especially today. So let's start by talking about JSX. Uh, JSX is it's basically sugar for those function calls we just saw. So this is just sugar for uh, that series of renders. It just gets pre-compiled before you, like on every save, you put a, set up a watch. It pre-compiles down into something that the browser can read, right? That the virtual DOM knows how to handle these uh, methods. Inline styles, we all get that too. Uh, it's really easy to use. You just put a style attribute in and put all your styles in. Uh, and that's automatically like putting an important on every one of those roles, uh, rules. You never do that, but uh, in this case, it's nice because you don't have to worry about overrides coming from somewhere else in the site. Uh, so React you, encourages that use and gives you a slightly different syntax. There's just a few things to keep in mind. Uh, first, your keys are camel case. So font weight is font weights, right? Uh, I think that's how you pronounce camel case. Uh, values are quoted, so FOO becomes FOO, and uh, pixels, they're assuming pixels. Maybe if you're using REMS or EMS or something else like that, that's fine. You just have to quote it and put, it in, uh, put the number in the, the uh, type in the quote. But it assumes pixels because we're generally just using pixels. All right, so that's just, that's the primer. So let's talk about how uh, React and JSX and inline styles help to solve that problem. The global problem, that's something we solved, like I said, in JavaScript. We solved it with CommonJS, with modules, with requires and imports. Uh, they're great. We love them. Uh, you can use them for styles, too. I can just import these JS files that are really just uh, uh, inline styles that will be applied later, and I can 
grab multiples, right? I can grab them from shared folders. Like that's kind of what we're showing right here is we're reaching further back in to get something that maybe we have the same style used in two different types of components. So you still have shareability uh, just without all the weird overrides that you have to figure out. Uh, sharing values, that's, uh, that's dead simple. Uh, whoops. So to do that, all you have to do is declare var, let, a const, whatever you want to use, and use it. It's like, that's going to work. You, are, you know what's going to happen right there. You've said it's going to be current height. Current height's a calculation. You don't have to do as much uh, sharing values. You're not going to have to leave those weird breadcrumbs around. Uh, the cascade. So extends, again, they make overrides super obvious. Uh, you just look at the order in a short list, and you can tell right away what's going to take precedence. It's the last thing. So we know, looking at this, font weight for styles.more styles, it's 700. Because we uh, set up the list in order, and we know that it's going to apply that order. There's no calculations that have to happen. Uh, dependencies. So again, this is that nice problem to have. Inline styles are delivered with your HTML. There's never that issue of running into two week old CSS that's been pulled in out of order. It's just not a problem. Uh, the specificity is obvious too. And you can tell right away what's gonna get applied. It's everything in that style tag. Right, findability, uh, this is an architectural decision you can make in a lot of different ways and still come at the same conclusion. You can even do it with CSS right now. If you don't agree with anything I say, you should. this is the thing that I think you should reconsider regardless of your other opinions. Uh, so folders contain all of their own dependencies. They become actual decoupled modules. They should have their template in them. So we're putting that in the JSX, that's taken care of. And the styles get their own file and it's relative. It's really close to the uh, element that owns it. If you need to share them, move them back out higher up in the, the chain to where they can be shared. Or maybe you have a shared folder. I think that's probably the best solution. Uh, so defining them is really easy. You open the, uh, the namespaced file that says styles. And you're done, you can go have a beer. Yes, uh, no, they might not have it open yet, I don't know. Uh, but yeah, it's obvious, it's that file. Obvious is what we're looking for here. It's, it seems dumb, it seems simple, but that's a good thing. Uh, readability, so the final problem that we're trying to solve, again, I've kind of touched on it already. This is much easier to read for somebody who doesn't come from a JavaScript world, right? A designer looks at this and they know what's gonna be output as HTML. Even a designer, sorry, I forgot to rub that in. Is Cody here? Even a designer. Uh, all right, so it's obvious what this is gonna be. It's gonna be whatever that custom component is wrapping an H1. You just gotta go look at that custom component to know what that markup is. Uh, so that's obviously a lot easier for most people to understand than those function calls, those create element calls. There are complications, so I, I think I probably convinced you all, right? I don't see any hands, but you are all convinced. Uh, there are complications you run into with anything. It's it's not a just a trump. It doesn't just beat everything. Uh, but these complications can be worked around, dealt with. So here's the ones I've seen and what we've what I've had to do to get around them. Or uh, if I haven't seen them, I've just kind of picked up on them from other people's posts. Uh, that kind of reminds me. Did anybody read the Chris Coyer response on this? The CSS tricks. Yeah, he hates this. But I mean, he makes all of his money off CSS, so there's kind of a conflict there. Yeah, right? Uh, but so yeah, I picked up some stuff from Chris Goyer that I'm trying to respond to as many of those problems. Uh, there are trade-offs. Some of it's not necessarily a fully better solution, and some of it might be a showstopper. Uh, we'll start with the easy stuff that we can win. Uh, dealing with clutter. So. You saw that JSX, everything, all the examples I showed you were pretty clean, they looked like HTML because I hadn't added all the stuff you, you typically add. Uh, as components get complex, you have to add a lot more properties, a lot more styles, and things get really long and that readability goes straight out the window. So here's an example of that. Uh, so yeah, let's see here. Uh, ignore this quote right here. Uh, my, this reveal JS slide deck thing. Uh, does some really weird things when it styles uh, JSX. You don't need quotes around it, you need those curly braces. I won't get into that, you should, if you're interested, you should look into React, but uh, I might have to switch back to the code at some point to show you what I'm talking about, is kind of what I'm getting at. Uh, so right here we have this huge list of styles that are being applied within the component, they're making the component fat, 
if they get really long, it, you can't even really connect the two things together anymore, right? You've got the, the parent container, and then way, way, way down, you're like, okay, all the styles have been declared. I've got all these children elements. Let me make sure I understand where they're coming from. Uh, instead, I think you should treat them like objects uh, because they're objects. Uh, so you declare an object, and you just call it directly in that style property instead of having to clear it all right in there. It just cleans it up a little bit. Maybe you put this, all this code, this uh, declaration of your styles up on the top of the file. Maybe you split it out into its own style sheet. Usually I start out a component working in this way, so I'm just scroll back and forth to get uh, touch everything I care about, and then I can uh, pull it out into its own file once I'm kind of completing that, that project, that feature, whatever it is. Uh, it makes for a much more readable solution. All right. All right, so complex property lists, also a problem for readability. Uh, okay, this is where the formatting is terrible. Let's see if I can pull this over for you. Moment of silence. Oh, I'm in the wrong. Oh, no wonder. Okay. Coming back around. Can you guys read that? Yeah? Good. Go bigger. Let's use all 80. All right. So, it's so hard to work backwards. All right. So, you see the problem here. We end up making these property lists. And these things can become, for a complex, this list can become like a whole screen long. Uh, same problem that we talked about with the JS. It makes it less readable, which was one of our big goals. So, we want to get around that. Uh, the solution, it's pretty silly to went through all that just to show you the solution, but is to treat them like objects because they're objects. That's how it's going to get passed through. It's going to be this.props is an object. So we assign our object, or our properties to our object, and can't quite see it here. And then we just hand it through with a uh, uh, spread, right? You guys familiar with spread? That's going to rip apart uh, these objects. And make each and pass each one of these keys through. So it's like, is uh, React uh, CSS transition group true? It's going to hand that through as a property, and then as that component gets consumed, it's going to see all those properties and recombine them back into an object. It's kind of a lot of hoops to go through, but it's quite a bit more readable. Let's see, if I can find my mouse. All right, uh, pseudo selectors. This is usually the first thing people run into. They don't work in line. Uh, that's just the browsers don't handle that, and that sucks. But we oh, we need to use like hover, right? We need active. We need all these states. We're used to using them. They're expected behaviors for users. So we use a library. This is the first time we've had to really break away from just straight up React. Uh, Radium JS is the solution I use. There's a few of them out there. They're like React styling things. Uh, it just decorates React and makes it so when it does uh, renders. It, it attaches what it needs to, or it makes it like a style component. We'll get into that a little bit. Uh, but it's kind of shimming, right? So it's handling the shortcomings that the browser uh, doesn't take care of us that we'd like it to. Uh, so right here, we've got, this is very similar to like SAS or less for everybody who's familiar with that, which I think is probably everybody. You nest this selector, this uh, pseudo selector, and it knows to apply it like a normal selector with a pseudo on it. And it'll make a separate little style tag and stick it in there and it'll get applied just like you'd expect it to. Uh, media queries, pretty much the same problem. They don't work in line, and we all have to use them. So here we go. Use Radium. Do the same thing. It's got a uh, slightly special syntax, the app media, and then you define your media query, and there's your rule. It's going to wrap that and make it a standard media query for you. Uh, this one is kind of a, a problem. I'm not sure there's a great solution to, but we'll get into it. So if you're uh, publishing your own components, say, on NPM, and you want people to be able to consume those and style themselves. Uh, 
but inline styles can't be overridden. You've got a bunch of importance, essentially. Uh, so you need to give them an API or give up and do CSS and style sheets, but let's try not to do that. It's what a pain in the butt. Uh, so here's how I would set up a public API if I was going to publish a component. Uh, add props for each stylable child element. Uh, if you have a lot of elements, that can be kind of a big, uh, a, uh, high bar. Uh, so the top level component gets set up by the consumer. This is what the, somebody who's downloaded your my component is going to get. They're going to set it up with uh, div style is equal to. We've kind of lost styling a bit here, but you can see what it's going. They're going to hand through their customized styles, and it's going to be specific for each one. These are not special keywords like div style and uh, link style. Uh, let's see, yeah, these are not like special things that React picks up. Uh, they're just random properties that you can use again later. So within the published component, when we're writing it, we're going to take each of our styles, we're going to build them up here, say these are a bunch of rules where the dots are, and we're going to uh, pull div style and link style off of props that have been handed in. Then we're going to do our handy extend. So we're going to extend first with an empty object, uh, we're going to pull divs, our, our own div style, and then we're going to override any rules from that with div style that's been handed through. Uh, we just kind of namespace it privately. Uh, but then you see we're just applying those same styles to each of those elements. Again, this is a kludgy solution. It's not the best thing ever. Uh, if you're publishing components, that might be a showstopper for you. Uh, might be better just to add CSS classes that people can hook onto and just send a style sheet just because it makes it more portable. So, not the, that, I, like I said, they're not all wins, but uh, CSS animations seem like they'd be hard. Uh, because inline styles don't handle them. But again, we can do it pretty easily with Radium. They even have an API specifically for it. It looks a lot like this, or it does look like this. You've got this custom Radium keyframes uh, method that's going to consume each one of these uh, keyframes that you've defined and give you your, uh, your browser prefixed versions of them. And then you just call them. I'm sure, I think everybody's familiar with ES6 uh, template strings. We're just going to pop that the result of that keyframes method right in here, and then it's going to work just like we did with pseudo selectors, right? It's going to add another style component. And then you can base, you can handle all of your uh, animations that way. So that's pretty neat. CSS transitions seem like they'd be easy, but they're not as easy as that. Uh, and this is probably the biggest showstopper I've heard from some people. Uh, you can use CSS transitions for things like hovers, actives, anything where you're going to use, you're going to have a pseudo selector available. But to do it for things like adding an element to the page, uh, you've, you've set an inline style of, say, opacity 0. When you try to set that opacity 1, it's just going to override that. The browser doesn't interpret that as something that needs to be transitioned from 0 to 1. It just flashes straight to it. Uh, so that sucks. But uh, React, the guys at Facebook were ahead of this. And they put together something called CSS Transition Group. Uh, basically, it's just going to add uh, special class uh, classes to your component at different lifecycle hooks that you can write styles to consume, right? You're still going to have to write that separate style, which is a pain in the butt. But we've got Radium style component. One more thing from Radium. Uh, it adds an element to the page that's like a style element, like you put in your head uh, if you were making inline styles on page. It's not a great solution. Uh, I wish there was something better, but it's also worth noting you shouldn't use a lot of this. It's bad for performance to have a lot of style components or style elements on your page. Uh, but the basic setup here is we pull the style uh, component off of Radium. We pull CSS transition group out of uh, the add-ons. This is, note, this is not actually a valid import statement. Um, but, okay, here's where we get the bad formatting again. Let me see if I can find some text. Oh, come on. Hmm. Okay, well, we're pretty close to it. So here's what we're actually doing. We're setting up a style element or component that accepts a rules property, and you feed in the rules, and it's going to make, like I said, an inline style tag. And you're using these hooks that come from uh, the CSS transition group, which is right down here. So you give it a, a namespace, essentially, that's going to get prepended with a dash. 
and you say, here's one of the life cycle hooks I want you to be active for. When, when we go through a transition up here, uh, give me a peer active. And that's going to apply just like you would expect a CSS transition. One more caveat, the presentation software makes me put this in. That should be a self-closing tag instead. Uh, neither here nor there. All right. And final argument that people run into is byte size, which is probably not a concern for a ton of people, but maybe you're, you've got an app with like that 14K uh, initial load budget, right? You want to make sure you get it through blazing fast. Uh, this could be a showstopper for you on that level, uh, byte size. All right. So here's what happens, right? So we make one element. We add these styles to it. I counted that earlier. That's 57 characters. We've added this element. Not a big deal. If you do the math, it's somewhere between like 57 and 230 or so uh, bytes that you've added to the file. If you have a large list, that starts to become problematic, especially if you have that budget. Uh, so right here, you could go up to about uh, 17 elements before you added a whole kilobyte to the page. Uh, maybe this isn't a problem for you. I really don't ever have moments where I'm not setting up my lists actually in the browser rather than having somebody download them. But yeah, it could be a problem you run into. So those are, I don't know, the tripping points. I think we solved most of them. The transition, again, that might be the one that kills you. But I think it's worthy if you can avoid that problem or if you can find workarounds. There's uh, all this stuff is still in process of being worked out. Uh, you can contribute to all these projects, uh, React and Radium, uh, which of course you should if you can. But uh, it solved a lot of problems for us. It's made our code a lot more readable, a lot more uh, findable. It's made things more editable. It's easier for us to talk about them together, to share them with each other. It's been a, a win for us. Uh, so, yeah. This is basically it. Try to make things nice for the next person, including yourself, who has to touch your code. Make it readable. Make it findable. Make it so they don't have to spend a lot of time on inane things like finding files. Uh, I think this is a good set of tools for it, but uh, your mileage may vary depending on your use cases. So that's it. Uh, hopefully, any hecklers, because I tried to be a little bit quick. Heckler. <laughs>